Well, hello English 111 students. This is Dr. Mark Tinsley, and you're joining me on week nine of English 111. I can't believe it. We are going to be reading chapters eight and nine in the textbook. We're going to be talking about types of arguments for the next couple weeks, so this is going to be good. Um, but here's the big thing. At the end of this week, your final drafts, your final essay, your submitted essays for essay number two are due. Now, at this point, for those who turned it in, I have reviewed your topics for essay two, which are, hey, we know what our topics are, right? <clears throat> Just a recapitulation, a, a revision of uh, essay number one. But uh, those of you who turned it in again, I turned in your topics and your thesis statements again. I did go over those. I did give you some feedback. So if you want to go in there and look, um, you should see that. Um, and some of you have turned in rough drafts for essay number two, and I will take a look at those uh, hopefully early this week and get you some feedback on those. And then you will make your revisions, your final uh, to your final drafts, and you will turn those in by this Sunday, October 25th, on Canvas. You've got to turn them in as a dot .doc or dot .doc .x. Okay? All right. So let's talk. You're looking at the slides here. Let me get us over onto the slides. And let's talk. Don't worry about that slide. Let's talk about your rough drafts. All right? <clears throat> your thesis. When you're looking at your rough draft, is your thesis statement the last sentence in the introduction? Make sure that it is. Again, all that I'm going through right now is just review, hopefully. Uh, but I want to go over it. I want to keep hitting these points because I think they're important, and they'll help you uh, really uh, understand the five-paragraph essay format and, and get this locked into your minds for the future. But that thesis statement needs its one sentence. It needs to be the last sentence in the intro. Also, in your uh, thesis statement, is your assertion clear? Does it make a definitive claim that can be defended? Remember, we want to steer clear of opinion in our thesis statement, and we want to make statements that are clear and defensible. All right? Your topic sentences, uh, when you look at those first sentence of each main body paragraph, are those sentences clear? Uh, is the main point in those sentence cl sentences clear? Main points in those sentences clear, right? Is the topic sentence the first sentence of the main body paragraph? We need to make sure that is the case as well. All right, and then is your topic sentence supported by evidence in the rest of the paragraph? Remember, one main point per main body paragraph. One main point per topic sentence. We're not trying to solve the world's problems in one paragraph. We're just presenting one main point that def that is uh, in defense of our assertion. We flesh out that main point throughout that main body paragraph. When we move to the second main point, we move to the second main body paragraph. Okay? Any questions on any of this stuff, you can ask me via email or phone. I am available for you. Your concluding paragraph, does it restate your thesis? Does it restate your main points? And does it offer next steps? Remember, these are the three components of a conclusion. Restated thesis, restated main points, next steps. And those next steps, make those as specific as you can. The more specific they are, the better. Now let's go back to the introduction for a minute. Does your introduction have a draw, that first sentence? Is that first sentence, does that draw me in? Does that hook me? And does that introduction contain background information, right? Okay. Good background information to kind of get my, uh, get me to understand what your topic is and where we're going to go in the paper, and then the thesis statement hits me with that final assertion, uh, topic assertion, and and like I said, I want to teach you to put your main points in your thesis statement as well. Okay. If none, if any of this is unclear, let me know. When you turn in your paper, final checks, is it four to five pages of written material? Four to five pages does not include the, t include the title page. It does not include the bibliography. So four to five pages. Does you, do you have at least two sources in your bibliography? Remember, this paper, this essay two, has to have two sources. Are you using in-text citations? You need to have in-text citations. Are you using 12-point font? Do you have one-inch margins? And is your paper written in MLA? Modern Language Association format. These are important. Make sure you've got these final checks in order. All right, so I'm going to assume that we do. You're working on your, uh, your rough draft to make it into a final draft. You're going to turn that in by October 25th, which is this coming Sunday. 
Uh, you're going to read chapters 8 and 9 in your textbook, and we are going to keep pushing forward in this class. Folks, we are going fast, all right? We are going fast. Okay, arguments of fact. Let's talk about the first type of argument, an argument of fact. We've touched on these before, and so some of this will be reviewed, but we're going to go a little deeper today. So argument of fact. An argument of fact argues whether or not something is true. That's the, sim that's the simplest definition of an argument of fact. Did it happen? Did it not? Is it true or is it false? This is an argument of fact. But these arguments, as straightforward as they sound, are not as straightforward as we may assume. For example, take global warming, for example. Um, you know, there is, uh, on either side of this debate, there are people who believe global warming is caused by man, anthropogenetic, and there are those who believe it is not man-made, not man-caused, I should say. Right? So, um, which is it? Right? It's not easy because there are scientists on both sides that can give you great arguments that support man-caused uh, Global warming and global warming that's not caused by man. Um, so it's not a straightforward argument. Is it, it's, it's either true or not true. I mean, man is either having a major effect on global climate or he is not, he or she, he or she is not. But determining whether that's true or not, whether global warming is a fact or not, is not as easy as one might assume. Now, I'm kind of using a, an old term here, global warming. It's the, the current term is climate change. And the assumption, whenever you use glo global warming or climate change, is that we're talking about man-induced, man-caused, anthropogenetic uh, global warming or climate change. Uh, and that's not as easy to determine as one might assume. Copyright violations. Uh, in courts around America, around the world every day, lawsuits are brought against corporations and individuals claiming copyright violation. Um, sounds like it's easy. Did you violate the copyright or not? But it's not as easy as it first sounds because determining whether someone's violated a copyright uh, takes a lot of evidence and a lot of uh, 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 argumentation and, and, uh, and, and discussion to determine if this is, has actually occurred or not. Um, because if... If I use someone else's words, well, did I use their words or did I use my own words and they just sound a lot like the original author's words? Was that idea my idea or was it somebody else's idea? And proving whether or not someone has stolen someone else's words or ideas seems easy, but it's very, very difficult in a court of law to, 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 um, to prove, as it were, that an infringement has occurred is not an easy task. So... That, those kinds of argument of facts uh, are difficult to make. Fake news, for example. Well, what's fake and what's real? I mean, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I listen to the news, I don't know what to believe anymore. Why do, why do I have such difficulty knowing what to believe? Because determining whether news is true or fake or twisted or if it's being reported with honesty or not, very difficult, right? So if I were going to make an argument that such and such story was true or not true, I would have a difficult case to make because I would be trying to make an argument of fact. But how do I know? And how do I know if people are being honest? How do I know if the news is being reported genuinely? Very difficult. And racism, issues of race and, and racism in, in our country. You know, is someone being racist or not? Are they being prejudiced or not? Um, sounds like an easy case to make, but not so much because determining someone's what someone's truly thinking and whether their actions were based on a pure or impure motives, et cetera, et cetera. These are difficult uh, cases to make. And when we're trying to make an argument, uh, maybe, maybe we're accusing someone of being racist. Well, we've got to be careful because maybe they are truly, maybe they're not. And how do we prove or disprove that? It's very difficult. So arguments of fact are not easy arguments to make. They're not straightforward, even though they're the simplest type of argument, I would argue. <laughs> uh, they're not necessarily easy arguments to make. So don't fall into that trap thing. Oh, argument of fact, that's got to be easy. It's not. But making good arguments of fact is important because of the consequences. Arguments of fact, we make them every day and they're important arguments. 
because of their consequences. For example, global warming affects environmental stewardship. It affects the longevity of our own planet. So we've got to know whether global warming is anthropogenetic or not. Because if it is caused by man, we need to curb it. And if it's not, then maybe we're spending too much money uh, on on cert- these cert- these uh, uh, mitigation techniques, and we could use that money to better take care of our planet in other ways. I don't, you know, I don't know. I'm not making the argument here either way. I'm just saying it is an important argument because it affects our environment. Copyright violations, for example, affect intellectual property. If, if someone has an idea or has written something, that's their that's uh, their intellectual property. That's their ability to make money off of that or reputation or whatever they're trying to to accomplish. But once some, if we allow someone else to steal that intellectual property, it affects that person's life, right? So copyright violations are important arguments. Fake news is important because it affects truth. <laughs> we all want truth, right? And uh, when we... Uh, when we're making arguments around this idea of fake news, it's important because we're talking about truth. And then racism affects people's well-being and freedom. So those are very important arguments to make. If if we have a, an organization or a, an influential person that is uh, making decisions and his behavior is being driven by racist motives, then we need to we've we got to we've got to root that out, right? Because that's affecting someone's well-being. That's affecting someone's freedom. Um, and so, do you see arguments of fact? are not straightforward, but they're very, very important arguments for us to make properly and well. Now, I break this down. I break arguments of fact down into three basic subtypes. There's arguments of facts that are scientific. That is, they deal with the physical world. So if we start talking about the carbon levels in the atmosphere, we're talking about scientific, we're making a scientific argument of fact. There are also social, what I call social cultural arguments. <clears throat> arguments of fact. These are things dealing with the complexities of people and relationships. So if I'm making an argument about uh, our society's, um, uh, well, well, racism, for example, in our society, um, then I would be making a social cultural argument of fact. If I'm saying that, let's say, for example, I, I say that um, racism is rampant within our governmental system, then I'm making a social cultural argument of fact or I'm going to try to make a social cultural argument of fact. And then there are systematic arguments of fact. These all start with S's, as you can see. And systematic arguments of fact are those arguments that deal with belief systems, like religion, politics, other ideologies. Okay, so is it all that important that you know the subtypes? No, I just want you to see that there are different types even of arguments of fact. Arguments of fact are a type of argument, but there are even subtypes of arguments of fact. Okay. So how do we make an argument of fact? Well, first of all, we have to choose or identify our issue, right? And here's my thought for you. Now, essay two, we're, we're just redoing essay one. But essays three and four, when you choose in your topics, if you're going to do an argument of fact, choose something controversial. I would say this for any argument, not just something that's generally accepted. For example, if we said John F. Kennedy was killed by an assassin, no one disputes that. That's not a controversial topic. We can watch the video. It's been accepted in, in all history books. John F. Kennedy was killed, and he was killed by an assassin's bullet. I can make that argument. That's an argument of fact. But it's going to be a pretty boring argument. What if I to- chose something a lot more controversial, like John F. Kennedy was shot by a shooter on the grassy knoll? Now, the grassy knoll shooter is very controversial. Some people believe there, were, there was a shooter on the grassy knoll adjacent to where uh, John F. Kennedy was killed. Other people say, no, 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 the shooter was uh, simply John Wilkes, uh, not John Wilkes, but um, it was simply, um, well, now I'm forgetting the guy's name. Uh, and he was in the books depository building behind John F. Kennedy. He was the single shooter, and he fired a couple rounds. Uh, so was it the shooter? Was there a shooter on a grassy knoll, or was there not a shooter on a grassy knoll? Lee Harvey Oswald is the guy's name. Thank you very much. I did remember it. Um, was it just Lee Harvey Oswald, or was there a shooter on the grassy knoll? I don't know. It's controversial. What if you chose that argument? Of fact, that would be interesting, and people would be more prone to read it. Okay, so we got to identify your issue, choose something controversial, and choose some choose something by asking yourself a pertinent question. Like for example, 
maybe maybe you ask yourself, why do people get so angry over abortion? Well, if you can answer that question, you probably got yourself a controversial topic. Or who in the world would believe uh, Barack Obama was or Donald Trump is a good president, right? Why would people believe that? Well, when you answer that question, maybe it gives you some fodder for a, a good argument of fact. So you, you kind of get where I'm going, maybe. You got, but but first thing you got to do is identify your issue. Pick something controversial. Pick something that means something to you. The second step in making an argument of facts, you got to develop your hypothesis. And a hypothesis is a prediction or a claim, right? So think of your hypothesis as a thesis statement. So you got to develop that thesis statement. Once you do that, so you, you find your controversial topic, you create a hypothesis thesis statement, then you study your topic. Go and study your topic to your into your, your eyes turn red, right? Uh, go and use primary sources wherever you can. Uh, always use reputable sources, books, articles, websites, uh, journal articles, things like that. Um, use sound research techniques, which we went over in class a few weeks ago, database searches, Google Scholar, you remember all that, and make all your notes. But go through and study, 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 study your topic, get to know it inside and out, and then, fourth step, refine your thesis statement or your hypothesis based on your research. Now, remember when we did this before, you might have to use qualifiers. You might need to completely change your thesis. You might delete, delete or add portions to the thesis. Whatever you need to do, though, get your thesis to what you want it to be, and then present your argument. Use your five-paragraph uh, uh, essay technique. Use proper grammar and syntax. Uh, use your illustrations where you need to. Uh, use proper forms of logic, etc. But go through and make your argument. But again, just to reiterate, you got to identify your issue, you got to develop your thesis statement, you got to study your topic in depth, then you have to refine your thesis statement, and then present your argument. But the revision process of your thesis statement is very, very important and very, very key uh, to what you do. Okay? All right. Here's what I want you to do I want you to actually pause the recording and do this. Um, some of you will do this, some of you won't, but I'm asking you to pause the, the, uh, the recording. And I want you to develop a hypothesis on one of the following topics. Not one you've written on already, but something different. Pick gun control or animal rights, health care in America, American relations with Korea or immigration. And I want you to develop a hypothesis, a thesis statement, uh, based on, uh, for an argument of fact, based on one of these topics. Okay, so go ahead and do that. Play around with it, and then when you're done, unpause and move on. Okay, so I hope you did that, and we will move on now. Uh, if you want to send that to me, you feel free to do that, and I'll take a look at it. Um, uh, yeah, I'd love for somebody to send me their thesis statement. I'll give you some feedback on it if you'd like. It's not for a grade, but... All right, now this is what we would do if we were in class, but I'm going to skip on through that. Okay, so that was the argument of fact. Let's move to the second argument we're going to talk about this week, and then we'll talk about this argument, and then we'll stop. But it's the argument of definition. Now, you'll remember when we talked about this before, an argument of definition argues for a particular definition or understanding of something. So we're saying, okay, this is my definition or my understanding of this particular topic. That's an argument of definition. And these arguments, like arguments of fact, are not as straightforward as some might assume. You think the definitions are easy, right? But look at this. Definitions change over time, don't they? Think about the definition of marriage. A hundred years ago, most everyone in the world would have said marriage is between a man and a woman. But look at today. Marriage is defined completely differently. Marriage can be between a man and a woman, but it can also be in most jurisdictions between a woman and a woman or a man and a man. And then on that issue of gender itself, again, what was it before? Uh, 50 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, gender was male, female. But today, look at how many genders we have and we're recognized. So definitions change over time. So making an argument of definition can be difficult by that, because of that. Uh, also, d different groups, different cultures define things differently, don't they? For, for example, age of consent. Even between states in the United States, the age of consent is defined differently. Certainly among cultures worldwide, you find a very disparate uh, group of ages of consent. Why is that? 
Well, because different groups, different cultures define things differently. Murder, the taking of human life, is defined differently around the world. Now, generally, most cultures say that you know, taking human life is wrong and there are laws against that. But there are some cultures where it's not uh, cannibalistic cultures, for example. There are situations where you can take another person's life. And then you think about um, uh, capital punishment. Some states in the United States allow for capital punishment. Some do not. And then things like oppression. What is oppression? Well, some cultures define oppression one way. Other cultures define oppression completely different. How cultures treat women. Uh, America treats its women much differently than some Middle Eastern countries. So you see, arguments of definition are difficult sometimes because things change. People are different. So we got to remember that when we're making arguments of definition. All right. We're not going to get in groups of three or four. We'll skip through that. But there are uh, subtypes of, of arguments of definition, very much the same as subtypes of arguments of fact. There are scientific um, arguments of definition where you're dealing with the physical world. There are social cultural where you're dealing with the complexities of people and relationships. And there are systematic where you're dealing with belief systems like politics, religion, and ideologies. Also, arguments of definition can be formal or operational in nature. What do I mean by that? A formal argument of definition seeks out dictionary definitions, structured and precise definitions for things, definitions based on particular facts. For example, a car has four wheels, an engine, and a drive system. This is pretty well accepted by most people around the world. If I'm talking about a car, I'm talking about four wheels, an engine, and a drive system. If I'm talking about a motorcycle, I'm talking about two wheels, an engine, and a drive system, right? Uh, if I'm talking about an airplane, I'm talking about several, who knows how many wheels, but two wings, typically, right? An engine, a drive system. So formal definitions, there are, they're pretty, they're easier arguments to make in some cases because you're looking, you, you can look out, do physical tests, as it were, on things and come up with particular specific, very precise structured definitions. Most of the time when we make arguments of definition, we're making operational arguments of definition. These are based on particular conditions. For example, the argument abortion is murder or abortion is not murder is an operational argument of definition because abortion is murder um, because it's taking human life or is abortion not murder because the embryo is not yet a life form. Determining what the condition or the state is of the baby in the womb is determines whether abortion is murder or not. And we don't all agree on the state of that baby in the womb. And therefore, operational arguments of definition based on conditions and state become very difficult to make. Okay? So one, I think one of the most difficult arguments to make is an argument of definition because of this, and the operational form in particular. But how do you make an argument of definition? You'll see a lot of parallels here with the argument of fact. First, you formulate your claim. You develop your thesis statement, right? You ensure you have a working definition. For whatever your argument of definition is, you need to have a working definition for what it is. Abortion is murder or abortion is not murder. There's your working definition. And ensure that that working definition is part of your thesis statement. You need to state what your definition is in your thesis statement. Then you conduct your research, just like before. You revise your thesis statement, just like before. And then you present your argument articulately using proper grammar, syntax, structure, using illustrations where necessary, and proper forms of logic. So a lot of parallels there with an argument of fact. But in an argument of definition, you're, 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 you're stating, you're developing your thesis, and in that development, you're stating your working definition in your thesis statement. So abortion is murder, or abortion is not murder. Because, right? And then you'd give your main points. I hope that makes sense. Okay, we're not going to do that. Actually, yeah, let's do that. Choose a topic from this list. Again, pause this recording. Choose one of these topics. Life, marriage, gender, freedom, evil, or wisdom. And then do this. I want you to create an outline for a paper that you would write on this topic. You know, this is not a paper you have to write in the future, but that you would write. So write me out a thesis statement with a topic claim and the main points. Write me out a topic sentence. You've done an outline like this for me before. A topic sentence with evidences listed below it that you would use to support that 
main point, write out a topic sentence number two with evidences under it, and a topic sentence number three with evidences under it, and then write your conclusion, or, you know, outline your conclusion, restate your thesis and your main points, and then give me what next steps you would talk, this, th that you would take. So this doesn't have to be full sentence outline. It can just be a, a, a sketch of an outline. But write out an outline. How would you outline the paper that you would write on one of these six topics, life, marriage, gender, freedom, evil, or wisdom? Create me an outline. And then if you want, email me that outline and I'll give you some feedback on it, let you know what I think. You don't have to do this, but I would encourage you to do it. Okay? All right, about 25 minutes or so that we took us to get through arguments of fact and arguments of definition. Again, these are chapters 8 and 9 in your textbook, so go ahead and read those. We will have a quiz coming up at some point on these chapters. Not this week, but soon. And, uh, yeah, let's do it. Let's get... Let's get Let's get an understanding of arguments of fact and definition under our belt. Let's also get your final draft of essay number two done and get that turned in by Sunday. And if you have any questions whatsoever about anything, this class or something outside the class, let me know. I am more than happy to help you. Listen, folks, if you haven't noticed already through my email interactions with you and uh, hopefully these, these videos, I am here to be a teacher. I want to be a teacher, a mentor, a guide, um, uh, someone that can help you navigate this semester and navigate English composition. I'm not here to judge you. Now, I do offer grades, right? But the grades are just for feedback more than anything else, to let you know how you're doing, where you, where you measure up as far as the course standards go. I am not here to judge you. I'm here to help you. And I've told you before, don't worry about your grades. Let me worry about your grades anyway because uh, it's not important to me to give good or bad grades. It's important to me to give good feedback. Uh, and people who put out effort in this class, I've told you this before, so this is no secret, and do the work and do it as best as they can, do well in my courses. You'll be fine. It's when you don't put out the effort, and that's on you, right? So, again, let me know. What can I do for you, all right? I am here for you, and I want you to know that, and I want you to internalize that because I'm here to be your teacher, your guide, your mentor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and that's what I want to do, okay? So reach out if you need anything. Uh, if not, I will be talking to you again next Sunday uh, evening and Monday morning as I do another lecture and, uh, and, and take us on down the road a little bit more in English 111. But for now, I'll talk to you later. Have a great and wonderful week.